It's 9 o'clock. We'll call the September 18th, 2018 Stearns County Board of Commissioners meeting to order. Roll call will show that all the commissioners are present. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. First thing on the agenda is a public access forum. Anyone that's wishing to address the board on issues that are not found on today's agenda may do so at this time. Speakers are asked to approach a microphone, give your name and address. Uh, individual comments are limited to three or four minutes. The total allotted time for this forum is 10 minutes. A citizen may speak at the public access forum once per month. And county board members will not engage in dialogue with speakers but rather refer the matter to the appropriate county department. Is there anyone here that wishes to speak at the public access forum? Yes, go ahead. Good morning, gentlemen. Morning. Morning. My name morning. is Mary Peters Shomo. This is my dad, Joe Peters. We are in Stearns County. We are in Collegeville Township. Let me be very clear why I am here. There is a destroyed type six wetland on the east shore of Big Fish Lake that due to the bulldozing and complete clear cutting of this wetland, pollution in the form of topsoil runoff runs directly through this area into Big Fish Lake. This runoff has been tested by the Sock River watershed to show that there can be over one and a half million gallons of runoff per event and that the topsoil that flows with this runoff transports high volumes of phosphorus directly to the lake. Phosphorus is the leading cause of lakes going on the impaired list, and the latest DNR study shows that phosphorus has doubled in Big Fish Lake. Shelley admits that the county does have regulatory authority over this area due to the county shoreland ordinance and the Wetland Act, but she fails to include that there are many more. The Attorney General's Office sent us 58 pages of statutes, rules, ordinance, etc., that were to be used to protect this wetland from any changes. All agencies have written to us and indicated that the county receives the funding and therefore has the duty to regulate shoreland wetlands. There have been cases in which you have asserted your power, most recently two weeks ago at your last meeting. Unfortunately, you only choose to assert your power over the private citizen and not overall. This is arbitrary and capricious and must stop. Some of the additional omissions in Shelley's reply are that the ice ridge was determined to be not part of the wetland. This is also an arbitrary statement that came from Don Adams. We have in writing from the EPA that a wetland separated from a lake by an ice ridge is hydrologically part of that wetland. This interpretation has been upheld during litigation in similar cases. Shelley also references a court case stating Judge Boland found that a conditional use permit was not required. That is also not true. Marcus Marsh, the author of the Wetland Act, testified at th that the list of alterations that the township was proposing were all violations of the Wetland Act. The Wetland Act was in place at the time of the bulldozing and clear cutting, not the interim rules. Shelley is not correct on that fact either. We have pictures, videos, court documents to prove all of this. The Wetland Act clearly states no draining, yet the wet wetland was drained by removing the ice ridge. No altering, yet Shelley's own admission, it's been altered to a type two wetland. The county blindly looks the other way when the township then says it's a road. There is no part of the Wetland Act that allows a wetland to be altered into a township road. This area does not fit any of the township road requirements. The DNR has in writing that the ice ridge must return or the township could be charged with the unauthorized alteration of a public waters. The DNR also wrote directly to you, the county, stating that roads shall not be in shoreland wetland impact protection zones. Finally, Shelley cites a report from Bowser 
This same report lists many trees that are in the wetland. The wetland was clear cut and does not have any vegetation. The only remaining is for a creeping Charlie a weed. And also in most of the area of the wetland, it is only dirt ground. Every agency has stated that restoration should occur. The pollution cannot stop without the return of the ice ridge, vegetation, and curtailing traffic. By Don Adams' own admission to a, in a county board meeting, he said that installing a standpipe would take the pollution out of the equation. To clarify what actually happened, he gave the county a road replacement permit, then completed all the work in the wetland. There is no standpipe, only a vertical pipe that has openings along the vertical side to allow the runoff to run faster through to the lake. You saw the video. I attached it in the last email you got two weeks ago. No more lies. Without fair and consistent regulation, you are setting a precedent and cannot enforce against anyone else. Anyone can use bogus terms, excuses, and claim since they own it, they can do what they want. It is time to take action to protect Big Fish Lake by enforcing the complete restoration of the shoreland wetland. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Board members, where should Mary be, be referred to here? I know. Yes, uh, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, this has all been um, discussed and reviewed by the county attorney's office mm -hmm. um, a number of times for many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know anywhere other than we would um, take this back as to the county attorney's office for another review. Right. Okay, can we at least do that? Right. Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner Mergen. Is there anyone else that wishes to? Okay, hi, um, my name is Kim Petman. I'm here as an advocate. Um, I do live in Sock Rapids, former resident of Stearns, but again, here as an advocate. I would like to ask um, if the county could take a very serious look, including the public, in looking at the elder and vulnerable adult abuse situation. We are the only state in the country that doesn't um, license assisted living facilities and I would like to see if this could be an agenda item but maybe more like a hearing. Um, one of the things that impacts us is what's called the worker shortage. Um, there's worker shortage in, in nursing homes, assisted living facilities. There's a home care worker shortage such as visiting nurses <laughs> and there's also a direct care worker shortage such as PCAs. A lot of people, because they don't have enough help at home, such as the elderly or uh, vulnerable adults, they have to move into an assisted living or nursing home facility, and they don't have enough workers. I would like to see what the county can do to help with this discussion, and I'd also like if um, I could please meet with Human Services and one or two commissioners um, to discuss this. I have reached out multiple times regarding related matters, but mostly can the county help facilitate a community discussion about the very serious worker shortage? Thank you. Thank you. So human services. Okay. Referred. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else? Yes, my name's Dave Benkowski. I live at 18873 Long Lake Road in uh, Richmond, it's Eden Lake Township. Uh, this is about the campers on the property you had at the last meeting, and I wanted to voice my opinion on this. I live at the very end of this, and uh, uh, what was said at that meeting was about how many, how big the lot was, and how many campers were actually there. I actually have pictures here. Um, there wasn't a, just a couple campers, there was eight or nine big fifth wheels at this uh, lot and plus about 40 cars. And this lot isn't 40,000 square foot, it is about approximately 26 to 27,000 square foot. So it's quite a bit smaller when it was brought up about having somebody having 40 acres and being able to, you know, 
have campers on 40 acres or have campers on a lot on the lake. I don't see anything wrong with somebody using their lot to, um, on the, to use the lake. That's not my intent. My intent is having all these campers there uh, as a homeowner and a lot of homeowners there. And a lot of them won't speak up because uh, they're afraid of retaliation, basically. And, and when you mention it to them, would you like to have this campground next to your house? Well, not really. So, I mean, you can kind of see how you get some people are for it, some people are against it. Now, it sounds like I'm the only one that seems to be against the thing. I'm not. I've been doing this for over 15 years, trying to get this taken care of through environmental. And as far as I can see, nobody from environmental even came down, let, yet I let them know that I was coming in. Um, I have covenances on that side of the property also, that on the lake side, just like I have covenances on my properties that were sold on the other side of the road. These covenances state certain things in there that, to say that you can't have this going on. And um, I was going to give that to Angie Berg here at the meeting and stuff so she could look it over. Like I said, I have pictures here showing the campers if there's some way I can show you or if I should hand them to her or what. Um, is there any way I can give them to you now or? Mr. Williams, would you be? Um, sure, yeah, you can give them to me and I'll make sure that everybody that needs to see them will see them. On Arts, the one that uh, had all the campers at, the other one had, I think it was four campers on it. But in the picture, it shows there's like Quonset huts that they put up. The one has a satellite sitting there and a refrigerator sitting out there, not chained, not locked. And um, to me, that would be a safety violation right there alone. They just seem that they, when they get done, they just walk away from it and not worry about it. And there is noise there. Even down at my end, I can hear them. And I'm several houses down. So I just wanted to give you all the facts. And it's not just the township coming in, and supervisors, and saying, oh, it was just a couple of campers. It wasn't. And I've had as many as 14 on Arts property. And that was many years ago. But that's how many. Now they get the big fifth wheels in there where they come down and they do the nice big turnaround on the cul-de-sac, which I live. And uh, so you do get to see them. <laughs> it's just not like they're not there. But, and also I have property on the other side and I've been turned down twice. I've had it for sale a lot. And the main reason was as soon as they see these lots there, what goes on there? I said, what do you have camping and they bring campers in? Oh, we don't want to be by a campsite. They walk away. So I guess that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Yes. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, I would just like to let the individual know that we had a discussion about this at the last meeting and the matter, matter was turned over to the Planning Commission and they're going to be looking at the ordinance about possible changes. So just be aware of that. and. Uh, I, I would encourage you to be in touch with Shelley Benson, Angie Berg, so when the Planning Commission has, has their discussion, you can be at that meeting. But as a board, we don't have, you know, we don't have an exchange of, of, of comments, but did you have just a follow-up to that? Yeah. Um, the thing is, I, I watched the video yeah. on the whole okay. thing okay. and seen what was going on there. Yeah. And I just, I just feel that... Um, you had to see both sides of the sure. situation. It isn't a, just a one-sided yeah. deal. And I, I'm a little bit disturbed that I didn't have anybody from environmental down here to talk to me, <coughs> and I even let them know I was coming. Yeah, the, the public access forum is an opportunity for, for an individual to share one or two minutes of an issue, yep. and then it's referred to a department head and that sort of thing. So I don't want to get into a dialogue, yeah. but just letting, letting the public know, because these meetings are cablecast, letting the public know that has been referred to the Planning Commission and they'll do the follow-up. Okay, thanks. Thank and if they're not watching now, they'll go back and they'll be able to see what right. you said and it, it's all recorded too. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else for a public access forum? Anyone for a public access forum? Anyone for public access? Seeing no one, we're going on to item B, the consent agenda, commissioners. I believe there was a correction on it. 
based on uh, uh, the last board meeting minutes. So, Mr. Chair, I will move the consent agenda with the revised minutes. <clears throat> and that had to do with the Shoreland contractor licenses where we didn't impose a penalty. And, and reference was made to um, Glenn Crenching, who had that similar issue uh, back on May 3rd of 2016. Mm -hmm. So that was the revision to the minutes. <clears throat> And then the other item is a consent agenda item that Randy's office brought forward. Can you just talk about it? Yeah, that? it's already listed in the consent agenda. It's just the resolution that okay. goes with that. So with that, I'll move the consent agenda. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion? All in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We are up to item C. This is a public hearing. Uh, conduct a public hearing to consider extending and updating the ordinance regarding use of motorized golf carts and neighborhood electrical vehicles. And we have Jody Tyke here to give us an overview. Good morning. Good morning. As you're aware, um, in 2014, we adopted an ordinance uh, to allow motorized golf carts, neighborhood electric vehicles on county roads and that met certain requirements. They had to be 30 miles an hour or less posted speed limit. They could not be arterial roadways. Um, this came because a few cities were interested in having these vehicles on our county roads as well as a few residents. You have an updated ordinance in your packet and the two changes that there are is that there is no sunset date on this one. The last two versions of this ordinance had a sunset date. The first one was for one year because I had some concerns that there would be safety issues with it. So we did one year, no reported issues that I am aware of. So then we extended it for three years. So because I still have not had any issues reported to me, any crash statistics, <coughs> anything like that, I have removed the sunset date from this. I also changed it so that cities can, they have the option to give the county a link to their ordinance on an annual basis rather than sending us the hard copy or a full copy via email. So again, I've had no issues reported to me on this, so I'm asking the board to consider this updated ordinance. Any discussion before we go to the? Well, uh, Mr. Chair, just a question. Where in the proposed ordinance is that? But the item that doesn't have a sunset we use in the former <laughs> ordinance which I should have given you a copy I apologize for that um, there was another section that had that sunset date between rev between section 7 and 8 okay. in this current one it just specifically listed listed that sunset date and you just removed that I removed that whole section thank you <clears throat> anyone else okay seeing no other board discussion we'll open the public hearing is there anyone here to address this issue in the public hearing? Yeah, my name is Dennis Drand. I live on uh, County Road 138 out in St. Joe Township. Uh, three, four years ago, something like that, I went, when I bought my uh, golf cart, I went to the DMV out there to ask them about if we had to have our license permit or something on the, on the vehicle. And at that time, she didn't know. She said something would be pending. Well, I haven't heard anything since. I run up and down the side of the road quite a bit, give my grandkids a ride, go over to Pleasant Lake and so forth on the shoulder of the road, and I haven't had any confrontations with uh, authorities or anything because there's no permit sticker on it because I haven't uh, been aware of one being needed. And then reading this latest thing that come out, there's supposed to be some kind of a, a permit, plus they're talking about a possible insurance and I don't know if that would would fall under your vehicle insurance or what. I don't think it's necessary to tell you the truth. As Jody has stated, there hasn't been any incidences in at least three years that she knows of. Those things don't go fast enough to get you in trouble, really. But uh, I was just kind of curious as to is, you know, if I've been in violation or not running up and down the county road because I don't have a permit sticker on it. And I'm just wondering where that's at right now because mm -hmm. nobody seemed to be able to give me an answer. Thank Technically, you. you would be in violation. Um, the townships typically wouldn't have an ordinance related to this because most of our county roads within townships are going to be 50 to 55 miles an hour posted speed limit. The concern with the um, insurance is that if a vehicle would hit the golf cart, 
um, if the golf cart would be doing something unsafe. I don't believe, I'm not an insurance salesman, I don't believe that your vehicle insurance would cover you as a golf cart operator. You'd have to look into your homeowner's policy, potentially. Um, I, I do believe it needs to be specifically mentioned or at least understood with you and your agent for that to be covered under your homeowner's policy. Um, County Road 138 in St. Joseph Township is 55 miles an hour. And our biggest concern for safety is the other vehicles on the road. I realize that if you are the, the golf cart is the only motorized vehicle on the road, chances of an injury are unlikely. It's more the concern of the other vehicles that are traveling at 55 miles an hour and on that particular road, trucks obviously, and with narrow, some of those roads have narrow shoulders. So this is something you should talk to discuss with his insurance agent? Well, yes, and technically it is in violation of the ordinance. The ordinance specifically states roads that are 30 miles an hour or less posted speed limit. Um, Non-arterials, County Road 138 is a collector. It's not an arterial. So does that mean that uh, you can't drive down the shoulder? That's what this ordinance would say, correct. Because I have, I have that slow-moving... Uh, triangle sign on the back of it, but I, was, I haven't been aware of any permit. Now, I have a side-by-side a -side, uh, Polaris Razor, and you have to have a license, a permit for that, and you can drive down any road other than the state highway or the interstate, And because I've taken it into the back roads into St. Cloud, I've taken it into St. Joe, no problem. The golf cart, like I say, as far as I've went with it is Pleasant Lake, and uh, I have no permit sticker on it because I don't know. I went, like I said, nobody could give me an answer. They said they hadn't had nothing set up and I haven't heard nothing since. And the county no longer, we, we gave out county permits that first year. And since then we um, evaluated, was it really necessary for them to have a permit both through the city and through the county so they could be on county roads. And in the discussions at that point, we said the county does not need to issue separate permits if the city already is. And, and again, we didn't cover townships in this, um, but it was primarily cities. And we said, well, if the city is already requiring a permit, they have an ordinance that covers the items we had concerns about, we didn't need to also issue a permit and basically double bill the people who wanted to do this. If this is something the board wants to consider, we can certainly look at that. I do have concerns on higher speed roads, primarily, like I said, with the other vehicles on the road, not so much with the damage that the golf carts are going to do to themselves, the golf cart operators, more so with what could happen if a vehicle were to hit a golf cart. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Mayor. Is, is it my understanding, Jody, that what's before us, what was in place and sunsetted in May and is being proposed now is only on county roads within city limits? Correct. That's all that this is. It, it does not address is. anything else, just within city limits. Correct. Okay. But the way the statute reads, we have to have an ordinance that allows this type of use right. on our roads. Now, our so, ordinance yeah. says within municipalities right. on roads posted 30 miles an hour or less. So, so what this gentleman is talking about, that would be a separate discussion? It would be a whole other section to this right. ordinance, okay. correct. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak on this. My name, good morning gentlemen. My name is Frank Ossendorf and I live at 615 7th Avenue Northeast in St. Joseph. It was Tom Krebsbach and I who gave rise to the golf court ordinance idea some three or four years ago. <coughs> I am pleased to see that you have brought some sunshine back to the ordinance, taking it out of the sunset phase and making it a more permanent uh, ordinance. I support and encourage you to adopt the ordinance. It is exactly as Tom and I envisioned it uh, some years ago. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else to speak? Anyone else to speak? Third call, anyone else to speak? <coughs> Seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. Discussion, Commissioner Merrick. I would move approval and then I have a comment. I'll second it. It's moved and seconded. Commissioner Merrick. The comment I'd like to make is that 
it would be refreshing if all of our ordinances would have a sunset on it, like as an opportunity to see what works and what doesn't work and if changes need to be made. Now, something was brought up here for, for townships, so maybe that's a future discussion. But the system is working. I don't know how long this was in place, for three, four years or something years, like that. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's my comment. If, if we could develop a system where, we review, where, we, where all government is reviewing all of their regulations, it would be beneficial. Mr. Nash. Yeah, and I would concur with that. You know, even in this situation, yeah, nothing's happened in three or four years, but I'm kind of a believer, too, to review stuff, whether it's three, five, whatever, you know, time frame it should be, because it seems like, you know, life is always changing, evolving, and, you know, as this gentleman pointed out with, you know, the township roads, you know, there it gives a chance to refresh the commissioner's minds and everybody else to take a fresh look at it and see if things have changed and maybe need tweaking. And a sunset huh? date could certainly be added back into this if that's the wish of the board. Commissioner Persky. Uh, no, no question about the uh, concern about uh, reviewing and, and seeing if there's necess necessity to change, but that would mean that we'd have a sunset date on all the ordinances. I, I'm just wondering if that's necessary. In other words, do we just have a review process where similar to our fee schedule that we have the opportunity to have input on the ordinances and see if there's if it, they need facilitate a, a change? I'm, I'm just saying that you, you're going to go ahead and have a sunset date, and so are, then are you going to have a re require a public hearing then for all of those, or are you going to just go ahead and you know or just approve them to move forward? I'm, I'm just curious how would the, what the process would be. Mr. Merrick. I think that's a discussion for another day, but that's a good point. <coughs> mm -hmm. Anyone else have any comments? Otherwise, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor, signify with aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And we are up to item D, Public Works. Jody. Uh, my first item is on page 39 in your agenda packets. I'm asking the board to approve advertising for bids for SAP 073-599-081. And this is a culvert replacement. The culvert is classified as a bridge because of its size. Um, the culvert goes under both 390th Street under Crane Township's jurisdiction and under the Lake Wobegon Trail. I have talked with the Regional Rail Authority and will be giving them an update uh, later today, in fact, but I'm asking the board to approve a bid opening date of October 18th, 2018, because we went from replacement or from culvert lining to replacement. I'm more comfortable with this work taking place next year because obviously, with the bid opening of October 18th, we're running out of construction dates on it. Um, so I am asking the board to approve that bid opening date. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion? All in favor, signify with aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. My next item is informational only. Uh, the Minnesota Transportation Alliance annual meeting will be held on Thursday, November 8th in St. Paul from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. I am planning to attend. If anyone else here would like to attend, let me know and I can work with administration to get you registered and we can coordinate driving to St. Paul for that annual meeting. Um, it, it's a full agenda certainly and an interesting agenda and the Transportation Alliance will be celebrating 125 years. Related to that on the same note, perhaps under miscellaneous, there is a candidate forum sponsored by the Minnesota Transportation Alliance. It will obviously be transportation issue focused. It's on Wednesday, October 3rd from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. at New Flyer, 6200 Glen Carlson Drive. There is no charge for that, but you do need to RSVP. And I can certainly register anybody who's interested in that as well. I already have meetings both of those days. Anyone else? I'd possibly be interested in attending. So I can send more information out too, certainly after the meeting on the candidate forum as well. And then I have no other miscellaneous unless the board has anything for me. Anybody have anything for Jody? Thank you, Jody. Thank you. We're up to Veteran Services. We have Corey Vasky here. The 
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Corey Vasky, uh, Director of Veteran Services and Stearns County Veteran Service Officer. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioners. Uh, my first agenda item today is to present on an initiative uh, recognizing Stearns County as a Purple Heart County by the Military Order of the Purple Heart. Um, that's the State Department, but this is also a national initiative by that organization. Um, there, there aren't actually a lot of counties or other municipalities within the state that have, have made this uh, uh, or done this yet at this time. Uh, so we are on the front end of, of making this proclamation. Uh, before, before we do the proclamation, I just want to talk a little bit about what the Purple Heart Award is and why I think it's important for us to make this proclamation. Uh, General George Washington created the badge of military merit in 1782 to recognize extraordinary meritorious service. In 1932, General Douglas MacArthur created what is now known as the Purple Heart Award based on George Washington's badge of mi military merit. General said, George Washington? General George Washington prior to his presidency, yes. You're older than you look. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, in September of 1942, the military standardized qualifications for the Purple Heart across all branches of service, making it exclusively for service members wounded or killed in combat. Though the merits of many military awards can vary depending on the review and opinion of a service member's leadership, the qualifications for a Purple Heart have always been inherently high. These high standards have been defended and refined over time. However, if, if you come across a service member who has been awarded the Purple Heart, you can be certain that they have paid a heavy price for that award. The Purple Heart Award is currently awarded to service member who is wounded by an instrument of war at the hands of an enemy combatant. This decoration is also awarded to the next of kin on behalf of service members killed in combat. At this time, I would like to recognize any Purple Heart recipients present. If you are a Purple Heart recipient, please stand and be recognized. Thank you for your service sacrifice. <clears throat> Here today, we pe publicly recognize your sacrifices and offer this proclamation as a gesture of our appreciation. Thank you. I will now read the proclamation we have prepared today. <clears throat> Whereas this, the people of Stearns County have great admiration and the utmost gratitude for all the men and women who have selflessly served their country and this community in the armed forces. And whereas veterans have paid the high price for freedom by leaving their families and communities and placing themselves in harm's way for the good of all. And whereas the contributions and sacrifices of the men and women of Stearns County who served in the armed forces have been vital in maintaining the freedoms and the way of life enjoyed by our citizens. And whereas many men and women in uniform have given their lives while serving in the armed forces, and whereas many citizens of our community have earned the Purple Heart Medal as a result of being wounded while engaged in combat with enemy force, forces, construed as singularly meritorious act of essential service. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the Stearns County Board of Commissioners hereby proclaims Stearns County as a Purple Heart County, honoring the service and sacrifice of our nation's men and women in uniform, wounded or killed by the enemy while serving to protect the freedoms enjoyed by all Americans. <clears throat> At this time, uh, Commissioner Mergen, uh, would you please come down uh, so that uh, the local chapter uh, can present us with the uh, Purple Heart community sign. Thank you.
this sign will be placed <clears throat> on county property as a display of our commitment to those service members who have sacrificed their minds and bodies at the hands of the enemy. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any questions or comments on this issue from the board? Thank you, Corey, for, for what you've done there. Something to keep an eye on the local habitat for humanity folks are uh, making an effort to uh, put uh, uh, specifically wounded veterans into uh, homes. Uh, habitat for Humanity uh, does a fair amount of this. Uh, this is the first uh, effort that they've uh, initiated that's specifically aimed at veterans. Uh, if you want a little more detail, there's a uh, uh, short story on that on the WJON website as we speak. So you might want to check it out. I don't know if there's a role for you or not. I'm not volunteering you for anything, but... Uh, no, that's okay. I did read the article this morning, and oh. uh, I am aware of the initiative. I've been approached uh, in the past uh, with questions. It, it gets to be difficult for us. There, there may be a role, is the short answer. Um, it's not clear what that role is no. because, um, you know, I've, our objective is to advocate and assist veterans in pursuit of benefits. I think I put myself in a precarious situation if I then begin trying to vet for other organizations who, who should qualify or shouldn't qualify for that. It kind of changes my role in relation to the veteran. So I've kind of walked the line uh, with that in the past. You know, we want to be as helpful as possible, but... Um, we also don't want to uh, position ourselves to uh, not be an advocate for the veteran. So You know what you're doing, you know. If there's a role, I'm <laughs> totally <laughs> confident that you'll... Uh, but if anybody's interested, yeah, reach out to us. And I have talked to um, the, the local Habitat for Humanity. Okay. I think somebody had talked to me uh, maybe a couple weeks ago or a month ago or so. All right. I'll move approval of prop proclamation. Is there a Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, my second agenda item today is to just is to present uh, my annual report to the board on regards of, to our office operations and some of our numbers. <coughs> um, just as a reminder, our department consists of four veteran service officers in Stearns County. Uh, three of those VSOs are in Wade Park, and one of those is out in Melrose full-time. Um, uh, the, the estimated number of veterans, the veteran population in Stearns County for 2017 was 10,021 veterans. Um, talk a little bit more about the population here in just a little bit, but uh, that number take with a grain of salt. Um, overall, our 2017 numbers looked very strong. Uh, we continue to see a high volume of client appointments. Uh, in 2017, our office conducted 3,024 client appointments, that's face-to-face -face appointments, uh, and 31,724 phone calls. And we also attended 81 outreach events. <clears throat> we continue to do regular outreach at Painesville, Holdingford, Albany, and the Eagles Healing Nest. Uh, we also through 2017, uh, continued to do outreach at the Sauk Center American Legion. However, uh, actually last month was our last outreach event at the Sauk Center American Legion. Uh, we had several months where no one, no clients showed up uh, to, to work, so it was difficult for me to continue to send staff out there for that period of time. If that changes, if there's an interest, we're certainly open to, uh, to reinstating that outreach event, but at this time it's just not a good use of resources. <coughs> Uh, currently, the wait time for a scheduled appointment at our Wait Park office is four days. Appointment wait times are consistently uh, between two to five business days and occasionally longer due to staff availability. I'll say f we are usually closer to that two-day time frame, um, but we had a conference last week uh, which has kind of pushed us back a little bit. So actually, at four days right now, we're doing pretty well. Um, However, in order to provide immediate services uh, to veterans and clients, we do offer walk-ins Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. at the Wade Park office, as well as in Melrose. Uh, uh, the veterans can just kind of show up and Irv usually can assist them. <clears throat> Our VA expenditures for 2017, uh, the, these numbers were, again, very strong, especially compared to our counterparts in other counties. 
Um, the total VA expenditures in Stearns County in 2017 was $160,900,000. $160, the VA expenditures included in this amount uh, uh, include uh, VA health care and construction expenses, compensation and pension payments to veterans, education expenditures, and insurance and indemnities paid out. Uh, the total compensation and pension dollars paid to veterans in 2017 decreased from $55,184,000 in 2016 to $52,803,000 in 2017. This drop is consistent with a statewide trend as overall compensation and pension expenditures in Minnesota decreased by $32.5 million in 2017. Uh, looking at our five-year trends, it appears that this is all within normal fluctuation. Um, it does it seem to fluctuate from year to year. Um, I think a better, a better marker of our specific impact, our office's impact on veterans this year is the increase in the total number of veterans receiving compensation and pension. In 2017, there were a total of 4,480 veterans, or 44.7% of the estimated veteran population in Stearns County, receiving compensation or pension. That is an increase of 181 veterans compared to the 2016 numbers. When this is considered in conjunction with a decreasing veteran population trend, I believe the net increase in total veterans receiving comp and pension is indicative of our uh, efforts of our outreach efforts as well as uh, uh, effective assistance by our office. <clears throat> with, that, with that said, I want to also just briefly present some information on some population trends for our veteran population statewide as well as within the Stearns County. Um, the quick disclaimer, these numbers are based on a 2016 population study that the VA did. It wasn't released until 2017, and it is based on, uh, it's based on an alg algorithmic estimation. So they kind of do a sampling, and then they project it out over the years. Uh, so the further we get from that study, the, the less accurate it is. I know when they did the last correction, it corrected it t upwards for us. We had a larger population than when they initially predict predicted. So that being said, you know, take this with a grain of salt, but I think the trend is important for us to know and understand. Um, as you can see on the second page of my report uh, on numbers, uh, barring a, a major military conflict, the veteran population is going to continue to decrease. In 2017, 54% of the Stearns County veteran population was over the age of 65. Based on this study and the 10-year projection for Stearns County, the projection is a 22% decrease in the veteran population over the next 10 years, whereas the statewide estimate projects a reduction of 27% in the veteran population. Um, I decided to pre present this information to the boards for the boards and awareness when considering current and future needs of our veteran population. I didn't intend to go in detail and speculate on you know, what that's going to look like or how that's going to affect our, our office. Um, there's still going to be a great deal of needs, not just for veterans, but uh, uh, their spouses in terms of benefits and so forth. Uh, so I just wanted the board to be aware of that, that trend. <clears throat> and my last, last item to, to speak about today is, uh, is a, is a uh, technology initiative that we've been working on last year. Um, <clears throat> If you look at my, uh, my map, I attached a map to uh, my presentation today. And that map is kind of shows just from, from uh, the last part of January 2018 uh, when we first started experimenting and then when we went live in February of 2018 to August 1st of this year. Uh, it, it's a, it shows how many uh, client interactions we had and what, how, uh, where, where they came from. So, uh, it, it's, it's not a very refined map, and the data itself we're kind of trying to, to improve. Uh, but I thought it would be good to just show you, you know, kind of where, where people are coming from within the county. Um, what I hope to do is take that map and be able to look at, you know, where are, where are our clients coming from within the county and use that to focus our outreach efforts as well as advertising initiatives and so forth. Um, Corey, yes. on that map it doesn't say what the different colors represent. I'm assuming the lighter colors are, are less less visitation. Yeah, it, the, the darker colors, it's, and, um, it, it, it's, 
grades of, of intensity, you know, so there isn't necessarily, I don't have a key on here that says, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know it, it just kind of, uh, um, to give you a visual concept of where people are coming from in terms of grades uh, or numbers of uh, uh, veterans from each particular zip code. Uh, oh, I see, those numbers are real small. In yeah, they are, okay. I apologize, okay. you know, this. Oh, that's fine, I see it now. Mm -hmm. The GIS assisted us in putting this together, and I kind of asked them to do that and with short okay. notice, and they did a great job. I think in the future I hope to present something similar to this, and we'll kind of refine it. Uh, um, but, I, and honestly, you know, I put in here one, that 1,783 office visits, so I actually mm -hmm. sat down and typed in, uh, calculated all these. There aren't 1,783 accounted for on this map, but it does, it does give a general idea uh, of kind of where people are coming from. Uh, and some of that, a lot of that has to do with the data that we collected through CRM and, and being, you know, being able to convert that into this map. Uh, but <clears throat> it also kind of shows you where, where people are coming from. A lot of these that you see, these outliers that are quite a ways away from, from Stearns County, um, a lot of those are burial claims. So family members of veterans that were Stearns County vets that are assisting with the burial claims uh, or survivors benefits and so forth. So. Um, but uh, you know, you also see <clears throat> Sherburn, uh, Sherburn County, and Benton County. We do see a number of veterans from those counties as well, uh, for a number of reasons. Some of it is the those veterans lived in Stearns County, established a rapport with our office, and moved across county lines. Uh, and some of it is, uh, you know, um, they like our office. So. Mr. Chair. So do those represent then office visits uh, or individuals in that if there's multiple visits by one individual, then they're duplicated? They are duplicated. Okay. Right now, right now this, but that is the, really my driving motivation to develop the CRM process was to be able to identify unique individuals that are visiting our office so that uh, we could kind of get a, get a good idea of how many veterans of our, of our 10,000 veterans, how many are we actually seeing, you know, mm -hmm. and are there areas that we need to uh, do more targeted uh, advertising or outreach? It doesn't necessarily hurt either to make the point that uh, uh, your office, uh, uh, compared to other counties that don't have a VA hospital, and the impact on the uh, demand for services for your office, uh, the reality is, is uh, well, for example, Sherburn County. Uh, you know, has, yeah, roughly comparable population, but the traffic through the VA, I mean, through the Veteran Service Office, uh, the numbers are dramatically different. That is true. It's less so than it was in past years because the state of Minnesota has put a service officer out there. Um, when we, we usually see those individuals, uh, they come from all over. Minneapolis, Milwaukee, Chicago, and they stay because the St. Cloud VA has an inpatient mental health treatment program. So they come and they stay and they realize, hey, Minnesota is a pretty good place to, place to live and there's a lot of support for veterans in the area uh, and they may end up finding a place to live here in St. Cloud or in the surrounding area. So that there is a definitely a factor to that. Uh, and we often see them after they're out of the outpatient treatment program and they're looking for assistance with housing or they're looking for uh, assistance with their claims and so forth, but that's definitely a, a factor. There's a lot of um, variables that go into services provided to veterans in this area, and I think I mentioned this last year, and it holds true still. Is you know there there are other entities, state and federal, mm -hmm. that that assist veterans in this area, and we in a sense get credit for that because the zip code of the individual living here, when the VA does their report, they live in Stearns County. So, Commissioner Merrick. Wonder if you might have any data that shows the number of homeless veterans. I do not have that off the top of my head. Um, as you can appreciate, that is a fluid number right. because, uh, especially with the St. Cloud VA, uh, they have a VA homeless team uh, that are assisting with uh, veterans. There's also a number of organizations in the area that assist specifically with homeless veterans, uh, and so we do have veterans that come here. And and uh, the, the nature of often with homeless veterans is they may stay. And they or they may lose or leave mm -hmm. excuse me but so that's a continuously changing sure. uh, issue I know that the VA does what they call uh, a point in time count usually it's in January of each year 
uh, and uh, and we do assist with that. They ask us to assist if we if we come across a homeless veteran on that particular day, you know, to call them so that they can try to register, you know, that. But um, it's a difficult number to provide. If you want, I can try to. No, no. I, okay. You know, it, it would be interesting to see that number and then what kind of outreach you could do to help those folks. That's where I was going with this. But. There are a lot of resources in this area, and mm -hmm. usually, I mean, uh, just to name a few. So the <coughs> VA has a VA homeless team. Um, mm -hmm. There's an association, Minnesota Association of, uh, or MACV, Minnesota Assistance Council for Veterans, uh, that specifically their focus is to assist uh, homeless veterans, you know, in finding mm -hmm. housing and, and, and jobs. Uh, and even TRICAP, you know, has a, uh, a, a part, a person that does work specifically with uh, veterans that have barriers to housing or may need assistance. Well, I think it's October 23rd or some, somewhere down the line where there's the Project Homeless Connect okay. at the River's Edge Convention Center. Greg Nolan, our Human Services Department, heads that up. Have you been in touch with him at all? I have not, no. No, I, I, um, I received an email on it. I have not looked into it further yet. Okay, okay. thank you. I've lost touch on the stand-down events in the area. Uh, you can just do a brief summary if that still is a service uh, option for uh, service Yeah, it's still is an option. The, they, they eliminated the spring stand-down, uh, but they are still having a fall stand-down. Okay. It's always the last Friday in October. All right. So same, you know, and, and the objective of the stand-down is to provide services to veterans that are homeless or at risk of homelessness, uh, and it's to bring in service providers, you know, nonprofit organizations, the county, mm -hmm. lawyers, you know, uh, VSOs and so forth. We all come to this event so that it's all in one place for veterans to, to seek assistance. At the Armory. Yes, at the yes, at the uh, the Armory on Veterans Drive. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Corey. Thank you. Should we take a break? Should we take a break now or should we go through environmental services first? Take a break now. Take a break now? All right. Yeah. We will take a five minute break. Requested by Commissioner Lensmeyer. It's not my problem, but I don't want Dwayne to get you know.
Lead us to the promised land. We are back. We have environmental services item F here. Good morning, Mr. Good Chair, morning, Commissioners. Shelley. Shelley Benson, Environmental Services Director. Um, I have several staff that will be with me today. Uh, we'll start with Becky Schlorf and Cole Lowen. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Um, this item is an informational item regarding the Aquatic Invasive Species Program that we have. We receive dollars from the state of Minnesota on an annual basis. And the majority of those dollars, the county gives out in grants and goes through a request for proposals process that is starting um, this month. We will be um, putting out those requests for proposals and the lays out in there the schedule for um, the evaluation of those and the um, granting or approval of those requests. Um, so with that, um, just some background, we have um, an AIS evaluation committee and then we also have an AIS um, awards panel and the AIS plan that we have lays out um, the whole process and the AIS evaluation committee is a subset of our AIS committee who are more knowledgeable um, about um, AIS and the laws and such and they make a recommendation um, about the first week or so of January they provide that recommendation to the AIS awards panel which is a panel that you appoint the first meeting in January. Um, the AIS award panel members also tend to and are encouraged to attend the evaluation committee's meetings um, earlier in the process to understand better the applications that are received in making their decision. Commissioner Merrick has been on the awards panel um, for several years now, including for 2018, and that is along with um, a Soil and Water Conservation District member, Greg Berg, and then our AIS staff, which this year would be Cole Lowen. With um, Commissioner Merrick's um, decision not to run for re-election, a new commissioner will be appointed to the AIS award panel, your first meeting in January of 2019. Just wanted to make you aware of that, um, that the representation from the board may have some um, some um, delay or inconsistency um, and uh, the availability factor as well as I said again the RFPs go out with the schedule laid out so that the applicants can make their um, their statement to the awards panel um, and um, so the schedule tends to get set so we hope that it all works out um, but wanted to make you aware of that. If you have any questions, we're certainly willing to take those. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Becky. You're welcome. Okay, so our next item, uh, we will be hearing from uh, Angie Berg, and this is related to our comprehensive plan, and she is here to go through that item with you. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Angie Berg with Environmental Services, and we're here today to talk to you about the long-awaited comprehensive plan update. Uh, so today we're not bringing an RFP to you for review. It's just updating you on what our office has been working on with others as it relates to this project. Uh, the board did authorize the budget item to start a comprehensive plan update uh, this year. We have been working with uh, the parks director, uh, who's going to be working with the parks board on the scope for the park section. Uh, and with the exception of transportation and economic development, the request for proposal will include a complete update. Um, maps, plan elements, diagrams, focus areas, etc. The last plan, as most of you remember, uh, was completed in 2008. We started it in 2006 and hoped to be done in a year. It took two. Um, we're going to try to take one year for this project as well, as we currently have it mapped out. Uh, as part of the RFP, we're asking the consultant to facilitate policy discussion, and that will include outreach meetings. You know, we'll have a couple of open houses, likely in Melrose, maybe Cold Spring Way Park, uh, at the beginning of the plan and then at the end of the plan. A few things that we've heard the commissioners, the planning commission, and our office, you know, hear and see a lot about would be, you know, solar development, solar and wind or green energy development. Alternative housing, there's been an increase in requests for farm labor and also accessory dwelling units. Think of the, a granny pod concept. We've also noted uh, growth pressure in the rural St. Cloud metro area, especially in the Sartell School District. Uh, it's been a lot of growth pressure as you've seen in the St. Wendell Township area for rezonings. 
and also just rule non-farm businesses. You know, could that be an auto repair? Uh, is it manufacturing? Is it an event center? What sort of rural businesses do the county residents want to see in the ag area? So those are some things that we've highlighted that we'll, we'll ask the consultant to facilitate discussion on amongst all of the other things that you and the Planning Commission and the public would bring up. And we're talking about the final plan will be delivered online and the, what we've listed here would be a more user-friendly and interactive format. We will pr work on a short executive summary, a handout, you know, that people can take with them. The benefits of a web-based web plan is noted here. It's more accessible than a binder on the shelf, and in fact, we're probably going to be disposing of lots of binders from 10 years ago. Uh, we can track and gauge usage of the plan itself, where we can't do that with a written plan. Uh, the public, as you know, is depending, demanding more interactive and innovative delivery methods. They like to go online and see things in a different interactive way. It's viewable from anywhere and it also can uniquely display maps and analytics. So we're working on the details of how the RFP will be separated out for both of those components, uh, but we're excited to start working on that. So today's just informational. Uh, we'll be bringing an RFP back. I'm working with the um, purchasing director on that, and we'll be bringing that back in November. Anyone have any questions for Angie? Ms. Persky. Uh, yes, Angie, thank you. Uh, you know, the, uh, I want to echo those concerns, St. Wendell Township uh, on their zoning and planning have a number of issues, but I also I, I've heard from a couple of the other townships as well, and they, you know, they want to be involved to make sure that their uh, needs are heard or their opinions are heard as well. So. Mr. Merrick. Now, the townships have their semi-annual meeting uh, coming up sometime at the end of October. You might want to share this information with them as well. So it gets, because that's that's who's going to be impacted. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Angie. Thank you. Item three, Joe. And I have uh, Interim Supervisor Mark Lateral here to uh, go through the next agenda item with you related to our environmental service fee dollars. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this item is seeking direction regarding the environmental service fee collection and expenditure of those dollars. The Budget Committee asked environmental services to review the dollars and discuss options with the board. The last change in the fee was in 2006. The county board then approved a $10 per residence and a 10% uh, non-residential solid waste <laughs> fee assessment. There are parameters on how these funds can be spent and they're meant to be utilized for the solid waste management service as um, the current dollars held are just shy of 6.5 million and the department has laid out five recommendations in the packet material concerning options for these dollars um, however the the overall recommendation of the department would be to maintain the current assessment rate at the ten dollar and ten percent collection rates uh, retain a minimum of three million for liability coverage and utilize approximately 3.5 million to expand the facility and program capabilities of the solid waste and HHW programs. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it to you for further discussion. Any further discussion? Mr. Notch, you look like you Yeah, uh, I gotta get back to where I seen it. So the ten dollar fee is per residence or is that like per parcel basis or how do you per parcel okay versus per resident or you're What's simulating it? those two as per res household residential yeah and then the 10 percent that's a commercial fee is that so every everybody every parcel of land in Stearns County has one or the other attached to it correct or only if it's well, got if a residence residential residential parcels so if they have a residence on that parcel then um, they get a $10 then charge. they have the charge because it's a waste processing it's related to how we manage and process waste in the county vacant lots well so let's say you have a, uh, a I'm gonna say a dairy farm site without a dwelling on it is there a fee attached to that building site I don't believe we have one unless it has a residential dwelling on okay. it okay I can verify that, though. 
Okay, so this has accumulated six million dollars by this process. Correct. Correct. Oh. Over time, there the, the current balance is at us approximately just shy of six point five million. Okay. I attached a spreadsheet and it okay. kind of shows the collection rates over the last. Well, the, it from ninety seven up until twenty eighteen, the collection rates you can see. Um, we did use a number of these dollars. Uh, you'll see the expenditure in twenty eleven. Um, we spent uh, you know four million to help build the HHW facility, so that mm -hmm. that. We use, so, utilized a number of dollars, but you can see from 2011, where we were at a balance of about 1.7 million, uh, to today's balance of 6.47, 6.4, almost 6.5 million. So. so this may be a possibility. We, we could reduce this to half if if we've collected over six million extra. If we reduce this to half and remain fiscally responsible, could operate on that. Mr. Chair, I think I think we certainly can operate on a lesser number. Um, we could certainly go down to, I believe, about seven dollars has us break even, and then those the additional dollars that we have currently that we'd like to utilize for additional programming. So, uh, at this point, that's what we're looking at: other programs, uh, collection of sharps, other other material areas that we would look at to utilize those dollars. So. Um, because there are parameters around those dollars, we want to be careful um, where we want to go with them. But just because we have the dollars doesn't mean we have to spend. Correct. Correct. We don't. Um, but it was brought up, it was brought to us um, to have a discussion with you. So you, as a board, get to decide. Um, environmental liability is the other side of this, um, and typically a single event is um, that we would be responsible for is three million dollars. Um, that's outside of the MCIT insurance. So we proposed kind of a 50-50 split. You certainly could leave those dollars in play. We could cut it in half and we could look to reduce those dollars um, over time through operation as well. Whichever direction you guys as a board want to go. I think this may be an area, one area where we could start trying to reduce the burden on the taxpayers a little bit. Commissioner Merrick. Yeah, I'd like to see uh, some. I'd like to see some type of a breakdown on the expenditures from when this was started until today. Uh, you can provide as much detail as as you want, but I'd like a summary of that. What I see here doesn't really give me a picture of where those dollars are going. Okay. We we talk about ten dollars per residential parcel or or business. So, you know, kind of if you look at your checkbook, you're, you have money coming in, but you got money going out. So summarize that in some fashion. I think that paints a better picture we before can. we make a decision. So this isn't time sensitive where a decision has to be made today, correct? Mr. Chair, no, that is not uh, time sensitive. Um, you as a board um, can, by resolution, change the environmental service fee dollars. Um, I will look to Randy to look at that time frame Typically, on assessments, we have a certain time frame that we need to uh, be aware of. So if there's an intended change to that dollar amount, it can be done by resolution, and then we just need to know when uh, right. it needs to go to the auditor's office. Probably, okay. um, I would say mid to late November. We should have a decision by then. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Commissioner Merrick? Yeah, the, the request that I made, what is the time frame for for assembling that information is that can you do that in a week a month I think a half a year or what mr chair commissioner merrick i think we should be able to put that together um we will work with our uh, auditor in our office and she should be able to uh, pull that information pretty easily okay. um, i believe so we can look by year of kind of the expenditures the operational costs mm -hmm. um, and those those big ticket items and get a summary ready and then look into the future a little bit where you anticipate those dollars by, you know, kind, of, kind of paint a picture so it makes it easier for us to make a decision. Okay. Commissioner Notch. Yeah, could you also break down the two revenue sources there too? How that, the $10. Yes. And then, you know, you, you have like different options in here. Um, similar to Commissioner Merrick's comment, you know, it, you create a timeline, you know, we'd like to purchase this maybe trailer in 
two years from now? You know, kind of where where you see it going, and what potential expenditures, large expenditures, might be down the road, and the time frame, so you kind of get a picture of, well, okay, you have six point five now, but you might have this million dollar project coming up. And all of a sudden, you take it down, and now you come back and say, "Oh, we should go to eight dollars instead," you know, because now we're going to be short. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Notch, we can certainly um, try to project out some of that information as well. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Then I believe you have one more, Commissioner Lindsberg. Yeah, sometimes it's, uh, the best decisions we make are things we don't do. Uh, when this matter came up, I don't know why it popped in my head, but uh, I thought back to the opportunity that we had. It turned out to be a dubious opportunity, thank goodness, uh, to spend about $65 million on a solid waste burner, which we never did. And uh, uh, now the immediate area is over capacity in that in that uh, department, and uh, uh, we'd had a uh, real uh, white elephant on our hands had we gone ahead with that. Let's see now, white e elephant. I, I don't think I in insulted anybody using a white elephant reference. You know, it's this PC thing is. I'm just trying to keep <laughs> up, you know. Anyone else? Thank you. Okay. Thank you for so um, the, the last item we have was an add-on item. Um, you do not have to take action, but it's, it's something that was brought before us previously by Minnesota Milk. Um, so Lucas Solstrom was here. He's the executive director and approached the county board through open forum on August 21st, asked about... Um, ways to support the agricultural waste recycling program. There was a grant that the uh, Tri-County Solid Waste Commission received and that grant ended at the end of June um, or at technically July 1st it ended. Um, those dollars were spent and utilized in the program and after that we heard from uh, Revolution Plastics, the partner we had in that grant that they were no longer able to pick up the waste in the way that they had previously um, indicated and that there are some some other issues related to that and so Minnesota Milk is looking to have the county um, assist and support financially the process and the operation to continue that so that farmers still have the opportunity to recycle that egg waste in a way that would then be long-term useful and create those markets still utilizing at this point uh, Revolution Plastics. So they requested some dollars. So within the agenda uh, packet or the uh, information that was provided to you, there were approximately 295 dumpsters within Stearns County. And based on the request that Minnesota Milk put before us of $250,000, um, not assuming we would take that whole amount, but um, of those dumpsters, about 39.5% of, of all the dumpsters are in uh, Stearns County. So when we took a, took a look at that, that equates to about $98,750 of the 250 requested if we're looking at a proportional share um, to help collect and manage the waste. Uh, if you have specific questions, you do not need to take action on this today. We certainly can bring it back for further discussion. If you have questions, I'd like to put as much information um, together as possible for you. Commissioner Mayor. Yeah, I, th I think um, we'd be well served to uh, get input from the Dairy Advisory Committee. I'm not sure when they meet. Uh, I'm not sure if they meet in October, but they certainly meet in November, I believe. So. I think getting input from the milk producers in that on this subject would be beneficial. I, I think it's a worthwhile program, but I'd like to hear from them before we take an action. Mr. Notch. I, I also think uh, that you guys have a Tri-County Solid Waste meeting on right. Thursday, so I'm, right. I'm guessing that will be a topic for discussion right. there. So, so both of those, Tri-County Solid Waste and Dairy Advisory? 
Do we need a motion on this, Shelley, to postpone it, or, or well, how would you like to address no. it? No. Okay. We'll just come back to you knowing that you didn't take action on this. So, okay. Mr. Chair, we will, we will try to uh, put that information out to the other committees related and uh, see what, what else we can find related to this uh, item for you. Okay, thank you. And when else, Mr. Chair, in, in advance of the Dairy Advisory, you might want to check with Becky Schlorf in your office and uh, the chair of the committee, I believe, is Joe Borgerling out of Belgrade. Let those folks know what's coming on that. I will do that. Thank you very much. Mr. Persky. Yeah, w with these dollars we collected on, uh, on these fees, and we have, with solid waste, we have that issue with that ag plastic. Is that, is that, is that rather than having those be new dollars that we would take out, is that, are those are possibly to be used in the future from correct. that, correct? Correct. And, okay, so. So environmental service fee dollars can be utilized. Um, those are dollars we have right now. Okay. And we can utilize them based on the definition within the statute. That would certainly be a permissible use. Mr. Notch. Well, that brings up another question. Would there be a chance that maybe, going back to Commissioner Lensmeyer's comment on the elephant in the room before, a chance to look at it, could Stearns County maybe lead something to take this on, you know, being kind of revolution plastics, kind of, you know, pulled back on it? I mean, we have household hazardous waste facility, you know, we we maybe have a capacity that we can be one of the leaders in trying to come up with another option? Other solutions. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Notch, I, I, I think that's an opportunity. I'd like to have that conversation with the Tri-County Solid Waste Commission, um, talk to our solid waste officer and have that conversation and see if there are other solid waste officers. There is a southern Tri-County um, that, that does collection as well and Minnesota Milk and see where they're at. So we'll try to pull all that together and then bring that back. Okay. okay thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you. thank you. At this time, we're going to recess the regular board meeting and conduct the human services board meeting. Melissa Huberty here along with Renee Frondes. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. I'm morning, Melissa morning. Huberty, the uh, Administrator of the Human Services Department. And um, we have one item on the consent agenda this morning, which is on G1 on page 58. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'll move the consent item. I right, can second it. Okay. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor, signify with aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, the regular board items start on page 60, and I have with me today Renee frown Deanst, who is the Division Director of our Public Health and the Human Services Department. And she's going to be giving the board an update on our community health assessment process and plans to date. Thank you. Good Mr. morning, Renee. Good morning. Mr. Chair, members of the board, <clears throat> as Melissa said, I'm here to talk to you today about the community health assessment that's required. This is one of the mandates that public health does have, Chapter 145A of the Local Public Health. Um, Act requires community health boards to do a comprehensive <laughs> assessment, um, prioritize issues um, in their community, and then to de develop a plan um, as to how public health and the community will actually address those issues. Um, we're also required then to monitor um, that plan and how it's unfolding and then evaluate the effectiveness of that uh, plan. Um, we're required by statute to do that um, assessment and plan and evaluation every five years. Um, and we're also required to make sure that we get uh, community input to put the plan together. So at the same time, uh, the Affordable Care Act and the IRS requires nonprofit hospitals to also complete what they call a community health needs assessment. Um, on the clients that they serve and they have to develop an action plan around what they identify as issues in their, in their um, service areas. Um, and their only requirement is that they need to do that in collaboration with public health. So <clears throat> the board may um, recall that um, several years ago in 2013 and 14, we did uh, started collaboratively working with Centricare, and at that time, the other hospitals that were 
um, in the county to actually try and do this work better together. Um, and at that time, what we did is did our survey, our behavioral health survey together, but we did our community health needs assessments or assessments differently, um, working together but differently and put together two different plans. Um, now there's overlap within those plans, but we, we did those separately, keeping each other informed. Um, what we've done in the meantime is actually um, worked to try to coordinate this better um, so that we have actually one process now that's actually happening. And we're doing that not only with Center Care, the hospitals in Stearns County, but also with Benton County and Sherburn County so that we're not duplicating since there's so much overlap. So on page 61, I gave you the hand of, of sort of the structure that we've um, developed to do this um, community health assessment and develop this plan together. Um, so um, at this point, the hospital's rotation is a three-year plan. Um, we actually spent some time with our federal delegates talking to them about potentially changing the federal legislation to give hospitals some leeway in doing like a three to five year plan so that they could come on our five year schedule. Um, but we didn't get that change to happen. So what we've decided to do is move on to their three year schedule. Um, now that does create um, a shorter timeline for us in public health, but we think the collaborative effort that it provides to us saves us a lot of time as well. Um, so we will be doing our assessment in conjunction with Center Care, developing one community health assessment, developing one plan um, that will actually then um, get rolled out um, in our communities. So we're all using the same process. Um, we're using the MAP process, which is mobilizing for action through planning and partnership. And this comes out of the National Association of County and City Health Officials, which is an affiliate of NACO. Um, and um, this cycle that we're doing since the hospital cycle finishes next spring, um, we're shortening up our cycle to get onto theirs. Um, we are in the process right now of doing four assessments that MAP asks us to do. Um, one is called Forces of Change, and we actually had that um, assessment meeting on um, August 29th in Sauk Rapids, and we had over 65 of our community members who attended that meeting. Um, and we really talked about what are threats and opportunities that we're seeing around health in our area. We're right now in the middle of a local public health system assessment. Um, that's a survey that's actually gone out to many of our partners. Um, and we're looking at environmental health, emergency preparedness, and infectious diseases. And we're asking them to give us some feedback on how well local public health actually addresses those issues. And then the last two assessments we'll be doing is a community health um, status assessment. So that's really looking at the health of our communities. What is the data telling us? And then the last one is um, what's called community um, themes and strengths. And out of that, we're hoping will come priorities that we can create um, and then begin to address those. So this oversight group is actually coordinating all of this work. It's got representatives from Centra Care, Benton County, Sherburn County, Stearns County, um, and then a couple other community partners. Um, they're coordinating all of the activities that are going on. They're doing the assessment data. They have work groups that they've established to help sort of augment the work that we're doing. And then we've got meetings that are planned latter, the latter part of this year and early into next year to, again, feed this information to the community, get their input, and then use that to create our plan. The goal is to have this all done by March um, so that it can go to the Center Care Board for their approval and then it must come to you um, as uh, the, the Community Health Board uh, for approval in March or April of next year as well as kind of the plan. And with that, I would take any questions. Mr. Merrick. Yeah, how does, and I don't know if it does, but the ACEs program, Adverse Childhood Experiences, does that fit with this collaboration you're talking about at all? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Merrick, yes, it does. It actually came out of the community health improvement okay. um, planning process. Um, mental health was one of the top priorities in our, in our current mm -hmm. plan. Um, and one of the strategies we had identified in that plan was to um, focus on ACEs, informing our community around ACEs, and more trauma-informed services. Um, and so, yeah, it actually grew out of that community health improvement plan that has been developed for the community. Would, would it be beneficial for this board to receive kind of an update on what 
what ACES is and, and what's happening with all of that? Mr. Chair, Commissioner Merrick, I'd be very happy to do that. I can work I, with I Melissa would, to plan. I think it would be a good idea okay. for all of us to hear that. Can certainly um, do that. Mr. Chair, Commissioners, I would add that there are several divisions in the Human Services Department all working in the same direction on this, so mm -hmm. we'd be happy to come back and share what the department's doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Thank you. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, I, I have one, oh, one additional, Mr. 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 Chair. Mr. Mayor. Um, I was at the NACO conference. Uh, this past summer and talked to someone from the National Institute of Corrections and they were in town here some years ago and they came back maybe like 10 years ago and we received information at one time that they're no longer in exist I mean the uh, we have a group that that comes in and, and uh, does a review no longer does that well I talked to a Katie Green who has contact information who, who the way I understand it says that they still come in and I wanted to share that with you and so I have her contact information here, and so if you'd follow up on that. All right, thank you. I'd be happy to. Thank you. Anyone else have anything? Thank We're you. good. Okay. We'll now close the Human Services Board meeting and reconvene the regular county board meeting. We're up to item I. We have George McClure here and Dory Dahlberg from IT department. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. George McClure, the Information Services Director of the County. Geez, I almost said old, old <laughs> Information Services Director, I suppose. If the, the shoe fits. Um, I'll give me a hand with the presentation this morning. Uh, my tag team partner here, uh, this corner, we have Dory Dahlberg. Dory's a, Dory's a project leader with our IS team. Our technology strategy and innovation committee completed a technology plan about a year ago. We brought it to the board. It was August last year, I believe. Um, one of our plan goals is to keep the board in the loop on the plan's progress. So uh, I'm here today on behalf of the technology committee uh, to give you an update on how we're doing with our technology plan. Uh, we have a couple of the technology committee members here. Uh, Mike Williams is a member of our technology committee, and Randy Schreifels, oh. and uh, Human Services Administrator Melissa Kubri is also a member. Give me some moral support in the audience. I guess. <laughs> we have um, seven seven technology uh, goals in our plan, and uh, we'll take about 15 minutes to give you an update on how we're doing. So yeah. You're probably wondering what a picture of the space shuttle has to do with the county's technology plan. Well, um, a couple of years ago, uh, Shelly Benson, Randy Schreifels, uh, actually at the time Mark Sizer, and I uh, visited Microsoft's office in Bloomington, and um, Microsoft showed us their latest PC software. And uh, after the demo, Mark said, you know, when it comes to using the technology that we have, he felt like we were driving the space shuttle but just to the grocery store. <laughs> so, um, and I, in a way, Mark was right. I mean, in a way, you know, employees do have a lot of technology on their desktops uh, and laptop PCs, and the county puts a lot of uh, resources into new technology uh, each year. But in general, you know, our employees use just a portion of the technology tools that are available to them. So, uh, so the goal of getting the space shuttle a little further down the road and helping us use the technology that we have uh, our plan's first goal is to uh, increase technology adoption, goal number one, increase technology adoption and utilization by employees. The premise being that employees are not fully aware of existing technologies and how they may be used to improve their work and that all departments could increase their use of available technology tools. So we're going to give you a, a, just a brief update of why IS is doing, kind of hit some of the highlights of the action items that we're working on. Uh, to make progress on our plan, uh, and also the uh, presentation, the action steps are, thank you, Dory, they're color-coded. You can see the green symbol, symbol set is for complete, and then the uh, yellow is kind of in progress, and then we actually have a, another color for having started yet. Um, so our first action step for increasing technology adoption and utilization by employees is to create a inventory or portfolio of available technology solutions and services. 
and that's green. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, the ICE department recently updated information about our department on the point, which is our employee intranet. And Dory's going to talk a little bit about what we've done there. Yeah, so uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. So over the past year, the IS Department has expanded um, information that we provide on the point um, to make us more accessible, transparent, and um, easier to work with um, for other departments. So we're going to show just a few highlights from that work. I'll take you out to the actual intranet, the point. If all the technology users. works. <laughs> you never know. Um, so the first piece I'm showing you here is a technology projects list that we've added. Um, when em this is available to any employee um, on the intranet and they can see um, projects for their own department. They can also see projects for all departments that are either currently active or recently completed. Um, it provides a latest status update and a contact uh, if they have questions about the project. Yeah, this is the same technology or project management tool that we use. We just make the information available uh, to all the employees. If they want to see it, and they can sort it by department and so forth. The second item I'd like to show you is called an application inventory. Uh, this is a listing of specialty applications that we have available. It's not a list of everything we have. That would be... Um, too long, but this is a list of applications that other departments might be interested in. Say one department is using a tool that works well for them and another department happens to be looking for a similar uh, solution. They could come out here and see what we already have, talk to the folks who are using it, or maybe inspire some ideas for changing some business processes. So that's the application inventory. And then the last piece um, that we'd like to highlight about our point updates is the Tech Talk blog that came out this summer. And um, we will be posting department updates, news announcements. Um, it just launched this summer, as I said. So the first few posts talk about um, spotlights on our three divisions to let employees know who we are and what we do. It will cover other um, topics if we have an enterprise-wide um, project rolling out or special things like social media day we covered. And next month we'll be covering um, cybersecurity month. So we'll have a variety of topics coming through that post. Thanks, Dory. Can, can you also, a little deviation here, show that main landing page? Uh, oh, that? yes. That we have? Is it, uh, it well, it. actually, yeah. the, the one, the list of the the services. List, yeah, is it services? Yeah. We're, go we're going off script. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> kind of part of the course, I guess, with me. But, uh, again, what Dory's talked about is our objective here is really, you know, as a services department, it's just to be easier to work with. And here's the thing. Example, we're trying to do a better job of communicating who we are as a department and what services, so those are the three different divisions, what services we offer, and then who to contact. So the individual uh, department managers are listed there, contact information, who to contact if you have a question on that particular service. So again, just trying to communicate better. Okay, thanks. Go to the next slide. Okay. Um, so our second action step for this goal was to implement an effective technology education and adoption program and um, we're doing that we're uh, we've increased our our PC budget you can see PC replacements there and we're placing more PCs and we're doing it faster our goal is to get all the budget PCs installed by the first quarter each year by the end of first quarter by second quarter I guess um, it just seems like you know if we have the budget for PCs then there's no reason to wait till the end of the year to get them installed. You know, let me get the budget, let's get them all done and get them deployed right away so we can use them. We're also really putting an emphasis on laptop and tablet PCs, so employees that are that work in the field, you know, or outside the office can be more mobile um, and spend more, more time in the field or helping their clients or their customers uh, and more time providing services and using the technology, uh, taking it with them. We're also uh, upgrading everybody to the latest and greatest version of Microsoft's PC software, which right now is Windows 10 and Office 2016. I mean, it may not seem like it, but it's a pretty big deal for IS, and it's a lot of work to keep everybody on the current version uh, and the latest and greatest software. Um, but again, we, we pay for the licenses for the most current software, so it just makes sense to use what we pay for. So we're going to have everybody on the most recent version and, and keep them there. We're also providing some training. We'll talk about that a bit, Dory. Sure. Uh, we're also providing some customized training um, through a product that we purchased, um, and it's going to offer some customized overview videos for all employees once they have 
um, received the Windows 10 and Office 2016 upgrade. These videos will highlight some basic tasks that all our PC users should know. Some new um, desktop functionality, some basic tools um, like email and calendars within Outlook. We'd like to get everyone up to speed and using the tools more consistently across departments. Yeah. I mean, again, I think it makes sense. It's not a lot of training, it's about 15 minutes, but if we're making the investment, we're upgrading, updating everybody to more recent versions. We want to show them some of the new feature functionality available in those versions. That's a 15-minute training that we've put together for them. I'm probably a little biased here. Um, Sectors, mm -hmm. color commentary. I'm probably a little biased here, but but there's a benefit to our staff having current technology skills and, and having those tools available to them. I mean, it really helps. Uh, I think going forward, even looking ahead, it really helps employees be successful and kind of thrive in what you call the workplace of the future. I mean, there's a lot of technology in the workplace these days. So. Uh, our second technology plan goal is uh, to evaluate personnel policies and other policies that uh, limit the effective utilization of technology. You can see our three action steps. Um, we've completed the first action step and right now we're working on the second action step which is we've reviewed all the policies and we're lo looking at updating those and, and trying to make them um, more effective, more conducive to using the technology that we have to, you know, to uh, uh, provide services and to align with the county's mission and values. So, thanks. Goal number three is to uh, strengthen technology resources. The uh, premise being that uh, departments require increased investments in technology combined with more project management and business analysis services. Uh, an effective utilization of outsourcing services and cloud computing services will help the IS department free up staff time, enabling staff to focus on more consultative types of services. Thank you, Dory. Um, our first action step is to implement the cost-effective use of outsourcing and cloud computing services. What we're doing is we're finding ways for IS staff to spend more time working with departments on their technology projects and spending less time with what I would call more commodity technology work like setting up and installing PCs. So what we're doing is we're, they would call it managed services, but really we're using outsourcing to, to, to help us get, as I mentioned before, all of our, for example, all of our budgeted PCs uh, installed faster and done by second quarter. Um, uh, again, if we have the budget for the PC replacements, let's go ahead and get them deployed so people can use them right away versus waiting until the end of the year. You know, if we do it ourselves, it takes time to get it and, and we do it kind of a, piece at a time. Now we're doing it as an event. You know, a couple of events and be done and get them all installed. Um, we're all, and also by moving to uh, 365, it says here, or really cloud-based technology, basically for us that the objective here is that it means less time needed for IS staff to install and maintain like servers and server software. And then that staff who really know the county business spend more time working with departments in a consultative role working on their technology projects. Um, next action step. The Budget Committee and the Board have helped us with additional human resources in IS and budget resources, so thank you. Um, we're also adding some new services, uh, technology assessment and business analysis services that we offer for departments. Um, goal number four is engage employees in the County Board in the advancement of technology, the premise being the services of the IS department and the application of technology solutions can be enhanced by the involvement of the county employees and the governing body. And you can see the yellow. I mean, we're making progress on all these objectives. Sorry. Goal number five is expand the delivery of programs and services through the county's website. The premise being the county's website <coughs> really is a vital platform for communications and conducting county business. Our website informs, facilitates communications, and is a key tool to the delivery of county services. Uh, if you recall, at least from my perspective, um, delivering, delivering more services or delivering more services online through our website has been a common theme at our last couple of leadership team retreats. Um, <coughs> so um, Dory's going to talk about the first action step. Sure. Uh, first the first action step is expanding the portfolio of website services. And um, I will show you a quick example. We have um, enhanced or added more services to our land services portal. This is a 
um, a portal, a kind of an offshoot from our public website. But we now have um, three main services available on the land services portal that have either been added or enhanced over the past year. Uh, the first is sewage treatment. That would include septic system permit applications or certifications, also requests for soil verification appointments. Uh, the second just launched, that is the new online homestead application process. Um, I think the assessor's office is pretty excited about that. It's going to reach a lot of residents. They can do homestead online now. Um, and then the third is administrative subdivision approval process, and that's for dividing land, as you probably know more than I do. So, <laughs> so we continue to expand our suite, if you will, our portfolio of services that we offer citizens online. Uh, the second action item is continue the development of interactive features that promote civic engagement. Uh, action step two. So what we're doing here is we're starting a discussion, around, a discussion around what we call digital government, or we gave it DigiGov for short, I guess. Um, what that is for us, what the discussion's about is um, we're trying to take a more complete, or it's maybe call it whole of, view of our online services, and it's probably where we could use some help going forward. But um, so think about it. When citizens come to our website for a service, we're thinking about what other supporting or complementary services we should offer so they can get everything done they need to get done and as few as visits as possible to the website, so more complete. So like what else and what other information and services could we offer as part of a more complete online service? Uh, for example, we did, I think you had examples the other day. Yeah, yeah, with the recently launched homestead application process, um, the resident will go through uh, the process to provide information to the assessor's office and at the very end of that application process they have the option to also sign up for electronic tax statements which is a service right. provided by the auditor's office. Mm -hmm. So that's just a small example of how we're trying to think to um, cross department. More together, yeah, thanks Story. And maybe even if it's not a service, not even a service the county offers, but we know they're going to need it. It's offered by another branch of government, we got to at least provide a link to that service also so make it more complete and then get as much done, you know, People have busy lives, you know, and, and help them through that. So, um, okay. Um, also, and you'll probably be hearing more about this digital government. That's okay. Right? This digital government or DigiGov concept in the future. We're still just talking about how to, come, again, put more complete services together. So, kind of with that uh, whole of, go in mind, or looking at what we would call the complete citizen journey, we're also developing more of a citizen services portal or working with Melissa and human services for a client services portal. Again, trying to provide all the information and services that you need in one place. Um, and then we're evaluating, also we're evaluating um, some type of application or apps or uh, to, so just so for, so it's easier for citizens to stay plugged in and stay connected with what's going on with the county. That's our last bullet item. Thanks, story. Goal number six is to improve how we manage our growing vol volume of digital content. We have lots and lots of digital content, that's for sure. Uh, lots of content. Uh, we, haven't really, we haven't started on this goal yet. Hope to get started on it maybe next year. Well, I think we will get started on it next year, I should say. Goal number seven is strengthen cybersecurity awareness and protection of our computing infrastructure and information assets. The premise being that maintaining a uh, quote, ready for business, which is really secure, available, and scalable, computing infrastructure is a critical priority for us. You can see our action steps. A, a lot of the work we're doing in this goal is like ongoing. It's not like an event thing we do one time. Uh, we're always doing proactive cybersecurity work, mostly behind the scenes, uh, working to improve and strengthen our cybersecurity. But these improvements are not always noticed by employees. Um, but some of the cybersecurity work that employees do see would be activities like um, all employees completed a cybersecurity awareness training program in 2017. We're actually right now updating our cybersecurity training and pre preparing for uh, uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. You might hear more about that's coming up in October, so you'll be seeing more about cybersecurity awareness <coughs> and experience. Like, we're, we're also a member of, uh, an active member of, I always give these big acronyms, it's MSISAC, which stands for Multi State Information Sharing and Analysis Center. It's a cybersecurity program that is sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security. And then uh, Randy, uh, we also just joined up with that. Uh, it's kind of a subgroup of MSISAC. It's the MSISAC election yeah. uh, group that kind of focuses on the election process and security. So cybersecurity is ongoing and it's a goal for us. Um, and that's our technology plan, uh, the progress report. Um, thanks for giving us time to present. Um, 
Other thought, I'd also like to thank uh, the county administrator, Mike, actually for his help with our technology plan. Uh, not that Mike did any other technical work here, but uh, <laughs> thanks to his leadership, he's really, he's really created an environment and a culture that really encourages uh, employees to use the technology that we have. So that's our presentation. Questions? Mr. Merrick. You know, just to follow up on uh, your website services and you know where the public can access, and Mike and I have had discussion about broadband, and he shared that with the board. Right. I wonder, Mike, or if you can give us a little update on where the broad, because in the southwestern part of Stearns County, yeah. broadband not so much. It's underserved. I guess yeah, call it. and so those folks out there are are struggling. Can you give us a little update? Sure, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Mayor. As you, if you remember, I can't remember exactly when, but we had some help with the Blandin Foundation and uh, Bill Coleman was here and uh, he had developed kind of a, just a di description really of the services that are provided in the county and he, he presented that to the board some time ago. Since then we've um, had conversations with, with most of the, ma or the major providers of broadband of, of internet service in the county and have sort of honed in on an area that could be a, an area of opportunity in the Belgrade, Bruton, El Rosa kind of um, school district area. There's, a, there's one um, tele, telecom provider in that area that sort of encompasses a good portion of that. And actually we, um, and uh, Commissioner Notch is gonna be there too uh, later this week. We're gonna have a meeting with uh, some school board officials and uh, hopefully some township officials to talk about how we might uh, prepare to um, apply for some of the federal grants that might be coming in some of the if, if the border border grants become a reality out of the state government again too so um, while there's no none of those monies are readily available now we're continuing the discussion and and, and with a focus on that area that is the most underserved Good. thank you Mr. Not. yeah it, it, you know it's it's nice to see you know the progress you guys are making on this last week we had the AMC conference in Alec and I went to the breakout one, which was the new the employees of the future, and right. and it, you know that comment was made where the you know the the county is more of a slow moving machine and can't keep up with the technology that the younger generations are right. used to, so it's kind of nice to see you know that we're kind of headed in that direction, you know as maybe being a little ahead of the curve to because retaining future employees you know one of the critical components was. The technology is what keeps a lot of the employees where they're at. From from my experience, um, um, it's not generally like the management that has like the you know the innovative ideas. A lot of times, you know how to use technology to solve problems and uh, work smarter. Kind of, it's the people on the front lines that use it every day. You know, and, and I think um, there's just a lot of technology, as you said, uh, in the workplace. It, it's a pretty important tool that we provide for employees to do their job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Um It's easy to uh, what, fall in love with the uh, uh, advanced uh, tech and uh, you know the future technology. Uh, this is a question regarding old tech and uh, to what extent do we still uh, run some of our stuff, for lack of a better word, on AS400 type stuff? And also, uh, are we still locked in to uh, some of the AS400 base uh, uh, uses uh, because we're working with other units of government? Um, Commissioner Linsmeyer um, is first. If you have an old tech question, you might have asked the right person. <laughs> How's that, old, old director? But um, I believe we do have an application. I think it's just one uh, accounting-related. Uh, I mean, um, on an AS400 that, that we don't provide, so we outsource that. It's a hosted, and we pay like a, a lease, a monthly fee for that. Um, that's the one I can think of. Um, I don't believe we're locked in. You know, I, I, it's not a topic that we talk about a lot. When we're talking about looking forward. You know, we don't talk yeah. back as much. Um, 
I'm, I'm just thinking about the uh, the CAMA and the assessment application. I don't know, Randy, if you know much about that. What's that? I mean, I, definitely we need, we need to progress that and move that forward. And we're trying to. I don't. I believe that runs on a, in the server environment now, but not in the 400. Yeah, the, the assessment. Mm -hmm. They're working on the rebuild of that, and I think have been for a while. Yeah, have been for a while, but I think there's some big dates coming up in early 2019 that they have to meet. Otherwise, mm -hmm. so that would be another. Probably uh, that'd be another example, more of a legacy system yeah. that is working on trying to be updated and refreshed, and it's been a little bit of a struggle, I, I believe, in working on it for yeah. a while. Those are the two that come to mind. And again, we don't have the 400 here. We ship that out. By the time uh, Kevin Pulis left, kind of went with That's Kevin. Exactly <laughs> the guy I was thinking. Yeah. The uh, uh, are we still involved? And I haven't heard this uh, re a reference to this come up for a while. We still involved with MCCL, that joint county. Well, the Minnesota County Computer Cooperative. I'm familiar with M Triple C. They call it. Yeah. We're, yes, we are pretty active, and um, in my opinion, you know, it's been a while now um, that the leadership changed there. It's uh, Lisa Meredith now is the uh, is the director, be the title, M Triple C director. She's done a pretty good job of progressing that organization. Uh, the more advanced and contemporary, I'd say, in the technology that they're they're using now, I and mean, has that been your experience, Randy? They're they're making some progress. Yeah, I think so. And they're, you know, they're in multiple areas now. So I mean, almost yeah. all our departments probably have some part of M M Triple C. So. Yeah. so yes, we're still an active member in the M Triple C. Well, the uh, uh, these multi-jurisdiction efforts are often lauded uh, the uh, downside of them is that uh, we only move as fast as our slowest moving member yes you know the old example of the buffalo herd you know <laughs> yeah you move as fast as the slowest buffalo and that that happens in joint uh, governmental efforts as as, as well uh, the uh, we don't we, I, it sounds like we finally wised up to uh, the uh, uh, the competitions for various awards by various entities. Uh, we get the warm fuzzy of getting awards on a national basis. I think we finally uh, realized that really what happens is we're doing beta for uh, for our vendors of various systems. So I'm uh, uh, I'm encouraged not to hear about that stuff anymore. Because yeah. I mean, how long are we going to be chumped uh, into uh, getting involved in that? Uh, the uh, uh, opportunities to uh, for even our own internal uh, uh, multi department. Uh, efforts. Uh, I'm thinking specifically uh, of uh, uh, integrating something, and this would be Randy's area as well. Uh, the integration of our uh, recorders functions. Uh, I'll be uh, interested to see uh, what comes out of that. I don't know if uh, uh, the first quarter would be too early for that, but. Uh, I'd be interested in being brought up to speed at, at the appropriate time uh, on that. Uh, Randy, you got any uh, insight, ideas, and so forth on that? Well, the, the, the study that you approved last board meeting is, mm -hmm. it starts to look at that and technology, um, both the tax system we have has a recorder module that would be integratable and um, the next widely used one in the state of the larger counties also has that. And so there is right some opportunities on the technology mm -hmm. side there too. Mr. Chair, can I make a comment uh, on that, uh, on those lines? Uh, if I try to get a crystal ball out, I guess, you know, what I see is one of our larger challenges coming up and, and opportunities probably in the IT area is um, you think back about it, you know, we, we have provided, for example, a lot of services online, 
things that were in line before we had to go over the counter you know now they're online so we had that in individual services pay this fee uh, apply fill this form out apply for this we have lots of kind of separate services now that, that are kind of transaction based but, but we have lots just in technology in general we have lots of systems I mean that's not going to change we're, we're, we're a large organization pretty diverse but we have lots of systems so, so trying to think of things more whole of you know an example may be I mean it's it's just a, a newer concept that, that's fairly progressive I guess um, we've been talking in IS about like methodologies things we could do like uh, what would you call it like maybe customer journey mapping you'd kind of look at the whole why does the customer or in this case citizen journey mapping what why does why do they visit what do they want and trying to think broader we've been successful in that in the past some examples would be like a uh, whole of property right we're offering a lot of our property types of services now we're not sending you like to different departments it's all provided in, in the related services are together uh, it's been a focus of uh, a human services administrator Melissa I would call whole of human services right you know instead of all the different silos of services trying to look more broader about providing more complete services and bringing other services together that are related or contextual to that service you know in a way maybe you could think of it a whole of employee we have lots of different employee systems they're all kind of separate so we're never going to put everything on one platform but mm -hmm. I think it's a comment you made Commissioner Linsmeyer that the the integration you know trying to move things to fewer platforms as a goal fewer separate systems and look more whole of but also the integration of our systems you know uh, a quote probably for Roma style back in the day would be uh, a paraphrase uh, human services administrator um, George I could have one client in 15 systems and not know it you know in that she's correct maybe more than 15 you know so to me that's one of our challenges coming up trying to look more whole of and contextualize across multiple silos that we have in technology I just wanted to quickly piggyback on what Commissioner Notch said about the AMC conference last weekend or last week. Um, I've sit on the transportation committee there, and uh, a lot of that conversation ended up going back to broadband. Mm -hmm. It came up repeatedly, and that's on transportation. So, yeah. so it's like a combination of broadband and mobile, you know, kinds of applications. I mean, you know, people mm -hmm. are connected all the time, and they want convenience of. of Quick, easy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we need a break before we go into administration? Can we get her done? I don't know. Looks like we're good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Dr. Williams, you're up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, your action uh, before you today is to adopt the 2019 preliminary property tax levy. As you know, um, once you do this, um, it's not the final budget. We will then again hold, we will then hold our truth and taxation hearing in late November, and then uh, would ask you to adopt the final budget at one of your meetings in December. Once you take the action today to establish the property tax levy, you could between now and adopting the final budget, you could lower that that levy, mm -hmm. uh, but you cannot increase it. The resolution before you today is, is, uh, presents the same levy that, um, that was presented to you back in August. It has total expenditures of just over $160 million um, and a tax levy of $80,479,000, and that's a 3.79% increase in the levy. Um, we do have an increase in our property tax capacity uh, which will allow us to decrease our tax rate uh, by about 2.6 percent. One thing that I do want to highlight, uh, because I, because of the way this was presented, I don't think I, I fully presented it. I, I say in the cover memo that we're using a fund balance of $878,000, but I neglected to um, add in there what, what we are using a fund balance uh, to keep the the debt portion of our levy down too, to the tune of a million and a half dollars. So we're really using uh, two, over $2.3 million in fund balance um, 
to uh, to make this budget balance. So in $2.3 million, if you added that onto the levy today, that would increase that levy by roughly 3%. So you'd be looking at a levy of 6.7% um, as an example. So I wanted to make sure I clarified that. We also are using fund balance in the highway capital fund, but I don't really consider it fund balance because we meant to save that money this year and spend it next year because of the, the lag in the, in the collection of the sales tax. So. So your real use of fund balance in, in this total budget is $2,378,000, which is keeping that levy down. Um, and then with, with that, I don't have any really any other presentation today um, other than to answer any questions you have. Mr. Merrick. Yeah, I, I sent some questions in like I do every year to you, but I haven't had a response. Do you have information on what I submitted? I, um, the one question that you asked was um, would we, if we had dollars to add back into the levy, and that's the one I think that we are somewhat prepared to answer today. The rest of them, I think the answer hopefully is okay that those come later. And in answer to that question, I think um, we had proposals, I think, this, should, this year that were uh, pretty reasonable, and I asked department directors to do that, to be realistic with their budget requests and, and not pad them or ask for more than they really need. There was an, and, and, but we still were able to uh, reduce those requests. There was a number of uh, people requested, additional people requested in the budget, but um, if I was to uh, add back into this budget, I still wouldn't recommend that we add more, more people. And so I think if uh, we, we really looked at one-time costs as we did that, because we had a number of pieces of equipment, particularly um, in parks and the sheriff department that, that we, uh, a cut from the proposals to the tune of almost $200,000. Um, having said that, and now uh, understanding that we have more than, using more than $2.3 million in fund balance, um, I also might, if I said, if, if I was told they increased the levy, I might just reduce some of that use of fund balance as well. I think those are good questions to create some discussion, um, but the recommended budget is, is still the same. Okay, well, the, there's a couple of them that I'd like to highlight. Um, like the estimated revenue from green energy sources, where do those go? What, are, what is that dollar amount and where do they go? And we, we might have some of those answers specifically. Those dollars are in the general fund though. They're, okay. They are uh, okay. directly reducing the levy in the general mm -hmm. fund. Okay, and then there was a, you know, one of the things that I'm, I don't know if concern is the right word, but these major software upgrades can cost lots of dollars. Do we see anything on the horizon in the next two to three years? that we should be aware of? Uh, you see, you, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Merrick, you see one in the budget this year is the computer-aided dispatch, yeah, uh, was... which is roughly $800,000. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I know we're looking at, uh, and Randy might be able to help us out here, but there are some um, changes coming down that um, in assessing and in the, in the tax mm -hmm. system, too, that could impact us. Well, I, I, I uh, guess, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know the dollar amount of that, but I think in the assessing area, if um, that product doesn't get to the point that's satisfactory for them, we may look at the whole thing then, and that could be a bigger price tag. Well, it's just something that I think that the board needs to wear, be aware of. You know, these software upgrades can be major dollars, like you said, 800000 this year. Um, and also, one of the questions that I guess I'd like to know is, um, we did a study of the sheriff's office and county attorney's office. Are we on pace with implementing those changes? Uh, Commissioner, yes, we are. Uh, you see the uh, two additional positions in the county attorney's office that are in, in the proposed 2019 budget. Okay. And then in the 2020 budget, we would see two more come on board. Okay. And that would, that would fulfill the uh, recommendations in okay. that study. Okay. And, that, and the Sheriff's Department, pretty much, those that are uh, um, adding significant cost have been completed. Okay, well, those are... And I, I just wanted to update my colleagues on the board about some, and I've, I've got more, but I'll, I'll wait for your response on those. That's my questions for now. Thanks. Anyone else? Well, then I'll give mine. I just wanted to remind everyone of the trends of the last five years, and I rounded these just to the nearest tenth of a million. Uh, these are the budget increase, or the levy increases, not budget. 2015, 1.2 million. 2016, 2 million. 2017, 2.5 2 million. 2018, last year, 3.5 million. And now asking for 3 million again this year, which is 
12.2 million over the last five years in increases, <coughs> and, th and this is perpetual. So I, I have a hard time um, supporting this because at some point we have to quit asking what the county needs and start asking about what our working families need. And, uh, and that's just not happening in my opinion. Anyone else? I, I just came up here if there were any other questions uh, related to the ones that Dwayne was asking and, and in terms of the responses uh, I'm going through and flushing out all the answers and we'll have that available for you and the commissioners next week. Okay, thank you. Mr. Persky. Uh, uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Merrick or uh, uh, Morgan, I, I, I understand your frustration with the, you know, the continually climbing costs. I, I understand your frustration with the continued climbing costs, but you know, I, I think earlier in the process is the time we should be, you know, looking at that and paring those things down. Uh, you know, we're looking at a preliminary budget here today, and it, you know, it doesn't sit well with me either. So, yeah. And, and you look at um, people with a residence of $100,000, they're going to have a 7.5% increase. I anticipate probably having a young single mother paying day, daycare and... Uh, um, a mortgage showing up at my home again this year. Mr. Notch. Randy, do you have any idea, or I'm, I'm assuming based on sales, we'll probably see an increase in valuations again? For next year, you're saying? Yes. Payable 2020. Um, yeah, you'd have to ask the assessor's office, but I think, you know, the real estate market is it's pretty solid. I don't know that you'll see the gain that you saw this year. Okay. And I, I guess I have to believe, you know, that none of us want to see any of these increases. And, you know, I guess I, I believe the county administration probably understands that and vets probably out as much as they can, um, you know, like I've said in the past, you know, some things that you just can't avoid, overhead costs, you know, stuff that's out of our control. Um, you know, what's the right answer? Well, everybody would probably like it if it went down every year. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, in our own households, nothing seems to go down either. It just sometimes seems like, you know, the, the rate of pay doesn't keep pace with the average consumer's expenditures. But, you know, in reality, we're looking at a, you know, a large county with a lot of programs and things going on. And, and we have to start somewhere. You know, like I said, this is setting the preliminary. It can go down from here, but we have to start somewhere. So. We do have another cut at the apple. Well, another, other, another couple cuts at the apple and the, the final adoption of the budget is uh, typically our last meeting of the of the year and from this particular point we can go down but we can't go up and uh, we can continue uh, uh, doing our wit our uh, ifs and buts analysis at this juncture but uh, uh, we also have to uh, get something done as well uh, this isn't uh, where I'm hoping to see this land but uh, uh, I also want to see us move on so I would uh, move that we adopt this uh, preliminary budget uh, realizing that uh, uh, there's a lot more to do Is there a second? Is there a second? Is there a second? Okay, been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Commissioner Merrick. Thank you. Yeah, I, the easiest thing in the world, I believe, is to say that we're going to cut everything. Just, you know, to reduce budgets, whatever. Uh, we have an opportunity as a board. 
uh, to take a look, take further look at further looks at the budget that administration has prepared. As in previous years, I have sent two or three pages of questions into administration. I don't know if other board members have done that, but I've done that and ask for explanations, and I'm comfortable with what I have received. I, I haven't received a response this year to what I submitted, but some of them are, rep rep are repetitious from previous years, but you heard the response to some of the other items that I had. So uh, there are obligations out there, and if any board member sees an item that they feel should be taken out of the budget, I'd like to hear that, and I'd like to hear that before we get to the final budget in December. If, if we have items that we think should be out of there, then, then we, we need to be aware of that, and then we can have that discussion. But for right now, I'm comfortable in moving forward. Thank you. Commissioner Merrick and I would disagree, disagree on what the easiest thing to do is. Uh, the easiest thing is just to increase the budget and then add what Adam Smith referred to as the invisible hand gets to pay for it, the people out there that you don't see. That's the easiest thing in mind. So we disagree on that. Yeah, I, yeah, we would disagree on that. I mean, if, well, maybe not the easiest thing, but the most popular thing. Okay, that's different. Yeah, that's, that's different. The, the most popular thing, everybody wants to see their taxes down, but everybody wants to see services that are provided. Human services is probably, what, one-third of our budget, and about 90% of that is mandated. So it gets less and less about what we have control over. So maybe not easy, but certainly popular. Every one of us and everyone in the audience and everybody watching wants their taxes to go down, whether it's property, income, sales, whatever it is. But there's services that need to be provided as well. So, Right, not easy, but popular. I'll agree with you on that. <laughs> yes or not? Uh, so some of Commissioner Merrick's comments, and it, as far as you know, betting some of this prior to December, it, it, is, are we able to bring that up then at a board meeting? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I just a comment to some of these things that we have cut or can be even a little bit troubling. I take a look at the, the cuts we made to some of the outside agencies, such as TRICAP, uh, also uh, Battered Women and Sexual Assault Center. You know, th those are things, obviously, that are providing service that is much needed. So these aren't easy decisions. Anyone else? If not, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor, signify with aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Roll call. Commissioner Merrick. Aye. Commissioner Persky. Aye. Commissioner Notch. Aye. Commissioner Lensmeyer. Aye. Commissioner Murrigan. Nay. Passes 4 to 1. Thank you. I think that brings us to our final uh, issues by commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Merrick. Nothing. Thank you. Commissioner Persky. Just one thing, uh, Commissioner Notch and I were out to Polar Manufacturing yesterday. It was a good tour. Nice to see that uh, facility being very healthy out there in, in Opole. Uh, one thing about it is that they're short employees, uh, welders. They need welders, and so we need some people to get out there and get trained and, and you know, make this economy grow. Commissioner Notch. Yeah, and the tag on the Commissioner Persky is, you know, we were there for, with the County Extension Committee um, yesterday. And as most maybe don't know, the county extension committee or group has gone through some major changes. You know, the, um, Dan Martins, who is a crop extension specialist, he's retired, and Nathan Drewick is the new one. Uh, and now Beth Berlin uh, resigned as the master gardener horticulturalist. So Friday we'll be interviewing to replace her position. So uh, the extension you know, portion of what, you know, the county's involved with you know, has seen some major changes, too. I, I think all their program leads have all changed except for their 4-H. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see where that extension uh, grouping goes forward. I mean, they've hired some really good talent, you know, as replacements for some retirees. So, so that'll, there's been a lot of changes there, even the regional director has changed. Commissioner Lensmeyer. What? Issues by commissioners. Good morning. No, I'm, uh, I don't have anything for you. Okay. Randy? You no, thanks. Doctor? Nope. Railroad Thanks. Authority meeting after this meeting, those of you that are on that board. 
Okay, thank you. Seeing nothing further, this meeting is adjourned.